All right, everybody, welcome to Elevate Your Grind again. Um, like I said, today's the, the formats are a little bit different lately, and also I have to produce these and make sure that we have everybody on camera at the right time. But please welcome my guest today, folks. Um, the industry, you know, the show has for a while gotten to a point where I really have started to get to CEOs of cannabis, like plant touching cannabis companies. And when I say cannabis, I mean the, the weed side of the industry, the one, the THC side of the industry. But, you know, there are so many conversations that need to be had on uh, just the business side of the industry, right? One of the biggest topics lately, and it, it's starting to go away, I hope, is legacy versus corporate, right? Well, you know, there's a lot that legacy brings to the table, a lot. In fact, there's a ton that legacy brings to the table. But one of the things that I promised that they probably were not familiar with prior to getting into the legal side of the industry was insurance and risk management and things of that nature. And at the end of the day, when you run a business, whether it's a cannabis business or any kind of business, this is definitely something that is super important. And it's probably a cost that I would say is overlooked at the beginning of most business plans and something that's added later when someone's like, ah, crap, I forgot about insurance. So uh, today we have a, a great guest. I, I had a conversation with this gentleman on Friday, um, just really started to learn a little bit more about this side of the industry. Obviously, with me being in the industry, it's something that we need to be very familiar with. So please welcome today's guest, Frank Costa, the Chief Growth Officer for World Insurance Associates. Frank, thanks for joining me. Oh, uh, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely, man. Um, so Frank, you know, we, we do talk about this a lot, right? We talk about the business side of the industry and how the cannabis industry really is just like any other company where, you know, a lot of people ask me like, what do I need to know? How do I break into the industry? What do you do now? I'm an accountant. Okay, we'll do that. But for a cannabis company, what do you do now? I'm in IT. Well, we use computers too, right? So, you know, when you look at this industry, obviously with the regulations and from your industry, but like, to, to me, this must have been just another vertical that you guys can go in. And, and when I say just another vertical, obviously, there's regulations, but you're in alcohol, you're in cigarettes, I'm sure, you're in other vice industries. I imagine this is just another one to pick up. It is just another one, and, and it's very uh, it's very similar to many of the exposures that we'll say are more traditional and that we're very acquainted with, and insurance companies are very prolific in offering coverage on. The uh, you mentioned it before, you know, the challenge here is that it's still viewed as an emerging industry by insurance carriers. Insurance carriers tend to be very very conservative. They are a little afraid of what's going on in terms of the legal aspects of the business, in terms of the, the changes from state to state. And a lot of those dynamics are what's making it a little bit harder to secure coverage in the marketplace. Thankfully, there have been some really proactive carriers. They're not the mainstream carriers yet, but they're coming. But there have been some very proactive carriers who have seized the opportunity and have recognized that they need to offer a complete package of coverage for these emerging companies, whether they're dispensaries or cultivators or in any aspect of the supply chain. So World Insurance, we're in an independent brokerage and we're on that same page. You know, this is a huge industry in a huge growth mode with over 400,000 employees currently, you know, with projections in the billions and the high billions uh, in a very rapid period of time. And we don't want to miss that opportunity. We think we can do good work for the industry. Um, and and that's why we're involved in it at this point as well. Very cool. I'm glad that you guys decided to get involved. And, and you know, it's interesting, right? Because you, it's, it's not like you formed this company last year and you're like, okay, we're going to go attack cannabis. You've been doing this for, for quite some time now. And, and you have a successful business that could quote unquote potentially be put at risk by, you know, going into an industry like this. I'm curious to know, and, and if you were the one who led this conversation or not, uh, how that conversation went when it was, I think we should look at this cannabis industry. There's a lot of opportunity here because I think that's a, I think more and more mainstream companies have had that conversation or are having that conversation. You know, I, I joke about someone being in IT, getting into the cannabis industry. I worked for an IT company, right? And I worked for an IT company and there was another one that was trying to recruit me. And I remember looking at them straight in the eye and I said, there is a huge opportunity in the cannabis space. If you let me target this space almost exclusively, I will blow away whatever number you put in front of me and we're going to destroy it because nobody who knows what they're doing, in my opinion, was focusing on the space or at least nobody who's standardizing it. There are a lot of people who knew what they were doing, but it was all 
custom solutions, custom developed apps, custom developed that, right? And we don't need to go down the IT rabbit hole. But I remember the conversation that having it convincing this company to focus on cannabis. And then it was one thing when they said yes, when we actually started doing it and they saw what was entailed, that's when it really started freaking them out because that's when it became real. Like they had, they didn't have the, the experience that I had. I had been in the industry for a year and a half on the ancillary side. So I knew what the risks were. I knew that if your payment processors or your, your banks knew that you were getting money from cannabis industry, there's a risk of losing them, right? And I tried to iterate that. So as someone who's a principal of their business and a C-level executive, when you or somebody else inside of the meeting room brings that to the table, how does that conversation go at first? Yeah, I think the conversation is, is clouded by skepticism at first because of a lack of knowing, a lack of education, a lack of, you know, uh, really thinking of worst case scenario of getting involved in an industry that is emerging, that is changing, and that has some controversies surrounding it. But when you bring it down to risk management and insurance, it becomes really easy. Let me give you a couple of examples. Mm -hmm. We have a fairly large medical malpractice division, and we insure a lot of physicians and healthcare practices and different types of centers across the country. By, by nature, they are getting involved now in marijuana treatments and in, and in legal marijuana uh, as part of their uh, offering to their patients. So we have no choice. If we want to stay in the medical malpractice business and selling that coverages, we're going to have to attend to physicians that introduce uh, mar medical marijuana into their practice. Another example, we have a huge transportation division. You know, everything from box trucks to long haul vehicles. Transportation for this industry is extremely volatile. It's an extremely high hazard situation because of the nature of the product they're transporting, because of the still existence of cash in their operations. So when you talk about transportation, you know, there are certain types of coverages and certain types of risk management solutions surrounding fleet safety, surrounding worker safety that we're really proficient at. So why not extend those to the cannabis industry? And I'll give you one more. Crime coverage. You know, crime is a, is a situation that insurance companies face that's extremely difficult, whether it's cyber crime or physical crime. It could be employee theft, to be crime surrounding the premises, surrounding vehicles once again. Look at this product. Look at the value of the product in the supply chain and the high propensity for a criminal act in terms of theft of the product. Another area that we're very, very familiar with, and we can easily apply coverage to those, to those situations. So the discussion at the high level was at first clouded by you know, what's going on with this industry. And then once you break it down into its component parts, it's basic risk management. It's basically basic insurance programs. It's transfer of risk. Uh, all things that we're very, very proficient at doing. Interesting. And it's very interesting. So the medical malpractice thing is really interesting, right? Because like you said, there are a lot of more physicians that are getting cannabis into their practices and, and they're going to be working with it. Um, let's break this down a little bit further and kind of back it up, right? We keep talking about insurance, insurance, and I feel like there are a lot of people who watch this show that may need a little bit of an education on just business insurance in general and, and what parts of the business are being insured, right? Like when we look at the different components of the cannabis supply chain, you have your cultivators that are essentially farms or, or high, very high tech farms that might be indoor or hydroponic where they can use agri Um, You have your distributors, which are for the lack of a better term, a, a delivery company with, with trucks and drivers and people on the road and a secure product that needs to be tracked. And then you have, you know, your retailers that is, is just like any other retailer is a store with shelves, right? Most of these, if not all these businesses are very cash intensive as well too. Um, so I'm curious to know like what, what type of, of insurance is the cannabis industry in general acquiring? Is it like a general liability insurance? Is it specific to sure. product? Because I also know, I know there's a lot of, and, and I'm sure you can talk about this one for hours, but, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of restrictions on, on things that you can or can't insure that's similar to the way that we work with the tax codes. So, so think of it, I'll try to break it down into like four pieces for your audience to think about. Think about property, think about liability, think about net income, 
and the human resources. So if you use those four general categories, that's what insurance is designed to protect and to cover. So for property coverage, there are some unique products out there for crop and agricultural products that will take care of the growers, that will take care of the cultivators. There are unique products out there for the construction of the greenhouses. Uh, all of the hydroponic equipment, all of this high-tech lighting and equipment, all of that property, our goal is to insure that property at replacement cost so that if you have a covered loss, the insurance company steps in and pays you for the replacement of that property. That's the goal. And that's the same goal that there exists for all property coverage across all industries. On the liability side, that's an interesting one. You know, we cover product liability. If somebody says they were injured by the product, that's product liability. So we want to extend that to any aspect of the product, whether it's CBD bombs, whether it's vapes, whether it's any type of or infused drinks. So if somebody says they got injured or they have a bodily injury resulting from the product, product liability, which is part of your general liability, would cover that. General liability is also important to have for your dispensary, if somebody comes in and slips and falls or gets injured on the premises, that's the basic reason you have general liability. And then net income. I mentioned net income as, a, as an area we want to cover. We want to cover your money. So whether you're an investor, you know, there are venture capital asset protection plans. So as investors in this industry, you want to have a complete program to cover your income. That includes directors and officers liability. It could include employment practices liability. There are a number of pieces to venture capital asset protection and management liability that the investor needs to be aware of and needs to have coverage for. And then the final one is human resources. So human resources is interesting. People, I mentioned at the outset, there's about 400,000 plus people in this industry. You have to take care of those people. That's Those people are the ones that are driving your business. And how do you do that with insurance? Really in two basic ways. One is workers' compensation. That's mandatory statutory coverage in virtually every state. So you have to have workers' comp coverage if they're injured as part of the conflict of their occupation. And the other interesting one is group medical insurance, group benefits. And, and it's pretty ironic you know, that, and, and which is an extremely expensive coverage, as we all know, because none of us are really enjoying the rising cost of group medical insurance. But how interesting is it that a big part of the offering from most of these carriers are wellness programs? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and guess what comes into the picture to reduce stress and, and to be part of the wellness programs, but the use of cannabis. So it's, it's kind of come full circle in that industry as well. Interesting. I have two questions from that. And one of them is kind of a dumb question. I just thought of all you were talking. It's not even Canada specific. And the other one, I think, is a little bit more educated. But long story short, I was just sitting here and you're talking about work comp and, and things like that. So obviously, that seems very straightforward. You have a trimmer on a farm, they, they cut themselves, they get hurt, whatever. It's covered under workman's comp. We now, since the pandemic, have probably the largest remote workforce of all time. Uh, yesterday, my genius was leaning back in my office chair and I fell over because I'm really, really smart. And I did that. Uh, the chair is actually broken and it's super uncomfortable to sit in, but the show must go on. Uh, but having said that, I, obviously that was my own accord. With today's day and age, with all these remote workers, I mean, my, my team at Heisman is completely remote. If somebody gets injured in their home office on the job, how does that work? Is that homeowners insurance coverage? Does that go to the business? I'm just, but that's just one that just, while you were talking, I'm like, wait, people are, are working from home. What happens if they get hurt at home? Sure. No, that's a great, that's a great question. And it's become a very prevalent question since the, since COVID began and, and home work has become uh, more popular, if you will. Uh, and the easy answer is workers' compensation coverage follows you wherever you go. So whether you're sitting in a in a traditional office, whether you're in your vehicle, whether you're at you're at your home, you're at a client's location, it doesn't matter where you are. If you're injured in the conduct of business, you're performing your job and you're injured in the conduct of business, you're covered under workers' compensation. That's your primary coverage. The uh, here's a little trivia for you: the most popular claim we have seen in workers' comp 
as a result of work from home is the development of carpal tunnel syndrome, mm -hmm. where people were actually working more hours at, because they were not commuting and they developed carpal tunnel syndrome for so much time on their keyboards. So the fact that they were in their home is not relevant. Uh, if they were in the conduct of business, wherever that is, workers' comp covers them. Interesting. So not many people falling off their office chairs for claims then, huh? No, their chairs are pretty sturdy. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how I did it. But all right. Um, the other question that I wanted to ask you is, you know, obviously being part of a startup cannabis company and just knowing this, this industry pretty well, cash is not very plentiful in this industry. Um, you know, and there are a lot of operating expenses that, that a company takes on, whether they're a cultivator, whether they're a brand, whether they're a distributor, and a lot of the margins in this space are super thin. So, you know, like, and I learned this when I was doing the IT stuff and insurance is obviously to me a little bit more important than IT, but, you know, did people want to have proper backup schedulings and offsite locations? And do they want to have remote access and all this other stuff? Yeah. But they couldn't always afford it because they had to buy dude tubes or they had to buy packaging or they had to buy whatever it was and there's only so much i mean i hate to say it but a lot of these companies realistically they seem like they're doing great on the outside but they're triaging on the inside because they're getting destroyed by high taxes and, and other expenses so with that being said i'm sure there's minimum coverage like workers comp and things like that that a company needs how do you guys work with cannabis companies of different sizes and i'm sure at different stages in their business to figure out the right mix of coverage that they can afford for them at the time. And, and I feel like this goes back to the level of risk that they're willing to take on. But I imagine that you guys have to get a little bit creative when you're putting this stuff together to get them the most bang for their buck to make sure that they have coverages they need, but it's not going to derail their business to where there's going to be nothing left to cover. Sure. Sure, there's there's definitely a hierarchy, and you know, and and like any other expense, you need to judge that expense and to see if it's worth it in relationship to your income and so on. But the hierarchy in insurance is very is comparatively simple. Um, easy example: if you want to get a license, you're going to need in most states you'll need to get a bond. It's twenty five thousand dollar license and permit bond. So you have no choice. You have to buy that bond. Bond is comparatively inexpensive. If you're going to operate in a state that requires workers' comp and statutory coverage, you have to get workers' compensation. So if you're going to have a dispensary, your landlord is going to mandate that you have certain levels of coverage, including general liability. So we use a hierarchy to say, here are the musts. Either they're required by law or they're required contractually for you to operate your business. So we get through that laundry list first and attend to those coverages that are required. The second layer is protection of your assets. Now, most times if there's loans against the property, if you're buying equipment and you have a commercial loan with a bank or with a lender uh, or with an investor, they're gonna require that you have property coverage to cover their investment. So once again, that contractual requirement is gonna, is gonna dictate what coverages you have to have. It's as you go up that chain where I wanna to talk to you about cyber liability and the exposure you have from having an online presence. I wanna to talk to you about crime coverage and, and the exposure you have because of the nature of your product. Those may not be contractually required, but then that's where your risk tolerance comes into play. Are you willing to self-insure? Are you willing to take that risk on without an insurance carrier backing you? Or is that too big a risk? Could that really jeopardize your business overall? And that's my job. My job is to help you understand the exposure, understand the nature of the risk, the likelihood of the risk, and then help you make an educated decision on whether that premium is worth the spend. It's um, funny. You talk about cyber insurance and, and, and can completely understand where you're going with that. Um, you know, I feel like when you look at traditional insurance and, and everything else, when we when we watch the news, when we look to see what's going on in the industry and you see dispensaries being broken into left and right and being robbed in California, up and down the state, they're being, to, you know, it's a cash intensive business. There's a ton of product. And I mean, it's, it is a perfect place for if somebody wants to rob it for them to do it. There is drugs that are worth a ton of money there is expensive equipment that's worth a ton of money and there's usually a lot of cash on site right so you know as a dispensary owner or even a manufacturer the the physical building and property and all that 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 seems 
a no brainer to protect because I can see it on the news, right? Cyber insurance, and I have a little bit of a experience in this world. When it comes to the online stuff, I feel like people are more risk tolerant. How do I say this the right way? Um, ignorantly. And when I say ignorantly, as in they're ignoring the problem, not they're a bunch of, you know, bigots. But, and I say that because maybe they don't see it or when they do see it, it's only reported when Sony gets hacked or when a big company gets hacked, right? When um, sure. Dan's car washes down the street gets hacked and they lose $500,000 in a ransomware attack. It's not really advertised because that's not, you know, outside of the local book of news. And I don't even know if there is a dance car wash. I need that up. But you see my point. People don't realize that the smaller businesses are getting picked off left and right because they most likely do not have the protections that the big businesses have in place. It's not going to make them the news. And it's a lot easier to grab a bunch of money from a bunch of smaller businesses than it is a marquee business that's going to end up pursuing you and prosecuting you because they have the means to do so, right? So I'm interested to hear, especially in the cannabis space, because, you know, one of the things that I feel like might be a challenge for you, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you are dealing with a whole bunch of people who had a extremely high tolerance for risk, because prior to doing what they did legally, it was a schedule one substance that put you away for a very, very, very long time. And a lot of the people that you're dealing with have been operating for that manner for a long time where they're like, I know the risk, but I'm still going to do it. So, you know, let's start with the cyber insurance question. And then I'd love to you to just kind of cover what some of the pushback you get, just because it is to me a very high risk tolerating crowd because of the history of the industry. Yeah. I mean, the pushback we get in cyber liability coverage, uh, network security, privacy infringement is substantial. And, you know, I, I still scratch my head over it because, uh, you know, you noted Sony and we hear about the target breach and we hear about Blue Cross Blue Shield getting breached. And it's it's just constant in the news. Ransomware claims are just skyrocketing, especially since uh, work from home became more popular, where there were fewer uh, firewalls and fewer protections to mitigate against those risks. So as an insurance professional, I I hear it in the media all the time, and it's constant news being you know, barraged upon the public. And yet, it's my, my impression is that a lot of business owners are either in denial, it's never going to happen to me, it's only going to happen to the big guys, uh, or they're just wishful thinkers that the, you know, the, the bad people are not going to try to infiltrate them. What we've come to learn, as you had point, as you just pointed out, is that they're the easy target. They're the low hanging fruit because they don't have as sophisticated systems because they don't have an IT department. They don't have a CIO or a CISO. So the bad folks know that they are more susceptible. And ironically, they have much more to lose. One ransomware attack, one virus it infects their systems, mm -hmm. one social engineering claim that ex, you know, takes all the money from their accounts, and they're out of business. They don't have an emergency fund. Uh, you know, they don't have unlimited funds to bear the brunt of that type of a loss. So I think two things, it's an education, like most things with risk management. I think two things, one is a, a, an awareness that they are actually more susceptible. The smaller you are, the more you have to lose type of an education. And part two is perspective. There's a, there's a misconception that cyber insurance is extremely expensive. It's, it's cost prohibitive. Uh, and the answer is that's not true. You know, for the smaller operation, for the dispensary, you know, for the cultivator, for a smaller operation, uh, you know, a good cyber policy with a million dollars in coverage could be as little as twelve hundred or fifteen hundred dollars a year. Depends on the, the you know the, the location and the number of other factors. So, it's not cost prohibitive coverage. It's very robust coverage that includes both third party coverage and first party coverage. And it's the policy that could keep you in business if you have a dramatic attack uh, on your on your data. No, I agree. And, and I think that's one that a lot of people neglect when it comes to risk management because the risk is, is invisible. And that's just human nature. When they don't see it, it's, um, you know, I don't know. It, it's funny. The more and more I look at it, the, the smaller companies are so much more vulnerable because when it comes to a smaller company, you know, we joke every company is a family, but that's where they're a lot closer. That's where they tend to trust the people in the business more. That's 
you know, where you're going to be closer to your employees. So you may not put the protections in that you think you might need because you trust your employees. And, and even if they are 100% trustworthy, it's just that you don't have the right protections in place where you go to like a Sony or a Blue Cross or something. And at the end of their, their day, their IT department's job is to idiot proof those computers. Like if we have a pure, like, sure, we trust Jim. He's been here for 27 years, you know, but uh, there might be an idiot that replaces Jim, or there might be a bunch of idiots that we hire. That's just the unfortunate, realistic side of corporate America. And they tend to have those protections in place. Whereas these small companies, it's it's just not there for them because they they don't feel like they need it. And it's completely on the other side. Um, you know, how when when you look at the cannabis industry, you know, I talk about the different parts of it a lot, and and I haven't done this comparison a lot, but you have what we call, what I look at as the cannabis industry, and I think what a lot of us think about when we talk about it, which is the THC plant system side of the industry. And then you have the medicinal THC side of the industry. Then there's the CBD side of the industry. And then there's also industrial hemp, right? This, this plant is really one of the greatest things in the world, and it does cover so many different things. Are you seeing a lot of opportunity with businesses across that spectrum? Because I feel like a lot of the... We're, where folks like myself, I feel like I'm seeing only a small sliver of the industry because I am so ingrained in the plant touching THC side of the industry. So I see the cultivators, I see the retailers, I see the brands, and there's a lot to handle there too. I imagine that you do work with hemp farmers, with CBD companies, with the people that are trying to, you know, isolate cannabinoids with, and, and even industrial hemp. Are you guys really running that spectrum? And how different are these businesses when you see them? Is it easier to ensure, you know, is it easier to ensure a, call it a hemp company that's doing industrial hemp versus a TAC plant touching company? How, how are the different levels of that? Yeah. So a lot of it has to do with the tolerance of the carriers. I would say plant touching uh, or non-plant touching is the first key criteria. Plant touching, you're going to have a, a, a more limited number of carriers that are interested in the exposure and interested in the risk. Non-plant touching, the, the carrier appetite expands. Um, you know, a lot of the pieces that we look at whether it's CBD infused drinks or you know anything along the lines of the manufacturing side, non-plant touching, bombs and and cosmetics and a number of other uh, you know types of products, we we can make those connect very easily to more traditional products in beauty and cosmetics and so forth. So that part is fairly simple. Uh, where it gets challenging and where there's a limited number of carriers is when it is plant touching, uh, the, the appetite there, although it's uh, less, uh, is starting to expand. So we're uh, contracted with directly carriers like Canasure and CanGen, NutriRisk and Conifer, and they've put together specific programs that we represent that include all lines of coverage for dispensaries and cultivators and plant touching operations. Um, the other piece that we've taken care of here, whether it's for industrial or any place in the supply chain, is we really want to offer more than just risk management and insurance. That's how we make money. That's how my firm earns a living. However, we understand that there are other needs that this industry has that are also being underdeveloped, underserved, and, and are not readily available. So, for example, World Payroll and HR. We have our own payroll company and HR consulting company and human capital resource management company. Um, traditional payroll companies like ADP and Paychex and so forth won't entertain this many of the participants in this industry. We will. So we have programs that we can put in place day one that attends to the payroll servicing for cannabis related industry. We also have a 401k program where most times you can't even think about setting up a 401k to, to benefit your clients. Uh, and we have great alliance with uh, a number of other firms that have established practices in accounting, in legal. Um, so our offering really is trying to serve the cannabis industry, not just with risk management and insurance, but to be a good resource for any of their needs, especially for a startup where you're so focused on the business, uh, you need a team of people around you to protect all of the various aspects of that business. So 
So Frank, first of all, I want to thank you for carrying the show. And this is one of those times where I wish we had an in-person podcast. So when I woke up this morning, I accidentally set my alarm off. I guess to call my wife and gave it the police to shut up my house. I had to prove that I was the resident of the house while while interviewing Frank here. And, you know, if I didn't tell you guys, I don't know if you would have actually had any clue, but Frank was talking to an empty room there for a second while I was dealing with the police trying not to get arrested. So thank you for that. But I did catch the tail end of that. You know, it, it is interesting to me because I there's another insurance uh, agent broker that we we have here at C Lab that I've known for a long time, Eric Brown. And I talked to him a lot and, and I feel like you have a lot of insight into this industry, into these businesses and what they're doing. As you said, you like to be a resource for everybody just because of all the different parts of the industry that you touch. You talked about helping protect investors. You protect every single part of the supply chain. Just the nature of your business gives you this insight because part of your business is to partially due diligence these companies. Not that you are, are going in there and, and doing like a, a thing, but the, the insurance companies will do it. There, there is a due diligence and there is always figuring out what this risk factor is. And I imagine you actually have a great idea of where those risk factors should be just from talking to each company, seeing the levels of risk that they're willing to take and seeing your experience from every other industry. I imagine that, you know, in addition to just being a way to protect your business and the other services you talked about, just your knowledge in general that you make a great advisor to the cannabis companies and, and I'll allow you to toot your own horn a little bit just because of the experience you have in the business world, as well as all the insight you get to all the clients that you work with. Well, I mean, thanks for saying that. And I, I appreciate those comments. I will tell you that for this industry and for the clients that we serve, our job is to present the client to the marketplace in the most accurate and yet the best light possible. You know, our goal is to present um, any any opportunity, any client, uh, so that they are our carriers that are competing for their business. They're fighting for their affections. That's as an independent broker. That's when I do a good job. And to do that, you know, we need to make sure we have complete information. We also need to make sure that the client that is putting forth the best practices that we shout that out really loud. So we are very focused on testing laboratories, OSHA compliance, uh, all of the rules and regulations. And you know what? What part of this is not that difficult? Are they good entrepreneurs? Are they good business people? Do they have a plan? Let's see the financials. Let's see their pro forma. The more ammunition we can provide to an underwriter to give them that warm, fuzzy feeling that this is a good risk, this is a potentially long-term relationship, the better terms and conditions, the better provisions, the better rate we achieve for the client. So that takes some work, both on the client side and on our side, but it's worth it in the end because you get a more robust and comprehensive plan and it'll be as competitive as it can be in the marketplace. It's awesome that you help the entrepreneurs with all that. And candidly, I've made this joke before, but as, a, as someone who would be in venture capital, I would pick your brain all the time to see the companies that you're looking at and the easiest ones for you to insure because those are probably the best ones for me to invest in too. Um, taking a, a step back and, and looking at the industry as a whole and, and looking at the, the regulations and everything else, you know, we talked at the beginning, you said all the carriers are not in the space, right? And that's what with most industries, all of the majors are not in this space. All the major tech companies are not in the space. All the major this, all the major that, right? Institutional capital is not in the space. What is it going to take for insurance companies to just generally cover the cannabis space? Is it going to take, do we have to go as far as federal legalization? Will it take descheduling? Can it take you know, if they legalize federal, but they, you know, kind of, if they just leave the decision up to the legality at the state level, will insurance brokers offer it in some states for other states? You know, what are we looking at as far as what needs to happen from a, leg a regulatory compliance where this is just kind of normal? When, when, do, when do the big guys? Yeah, I don't think there's an, an actual flip the switch tipping point, you know, like federal uh, legalization. I don't think that's going to be the case with mainstream carriers. Uh, keep in mind, think about workers' comp as an easy example. Workers' compensation coverage is regulated by the states. So there are individual laws and individual parameters and appetite for underwriting and so forth for insurance carriers state by state. So I would think that this is going to basically look like 
that type of a model moving forward. So I don't think they're waiting for uh, federal legalization. They are obviously watching the legislation very closely, the State Act, the Safe Banking Act. You know, they're watching hemp and CBD legislation extremely carefully. And I think this is how it's going to happen and get involved in mainstream. And it's starting to happen now. They're going to dip their toe in the water slowly on specific products, specific types of policies where they feel they can justify getting involved in this space. Some examples that on the management liability side, we're already seeing a broader array of carriers writing directors and officers liability coverage because their exposure as investors is in many ways not different from their exposure for investors in other industries. So I think D&O coverage is going to come on mainstream with Chubb and Travelers and Hartford and some of the names you know more quickly. Uh, on the CBD side, we're definitely going to see the mainstream carriers expand their appetite more quickly. They're already in cosmetics. They're already in beauty products. They're already in different types of bombs and oils. This is another extension of those products. So that'll be the justification for the mainstream carriers like Hanover and Zurich and AIG to get involved in those industries. So I think you'll see a couple of different uh, ways that the industry will expand. It'll probably be by policy. Do I, do I think that general liability and product liability coverage across the industry is coming soon from Chubb? No, probably not. Okay. That's going to take some more time. Um, but, but I do see, you know, that, that as the insurance carriers view this industry as maturing, and as they see the trending, you know, follow the money, as they see the growth in the industry, as they see the growth in the opportunity, insurance companies will find good reason to be directly involved. And you know, that's that's part of what emerging risks for insurance companies are all about. So, um, so I, I do believe you'll see the mainstream carriers in there in the next three to five years, pretty much across the board. Interesting. That's very cool. Yeah, man, I mean, I... I... I'm always interested to see how things progress forward, right? You know, we look at how far this industry has come, and I think there's only two states in the entire country right now that have no legal access to cannabis whatsoever, and it's Idaho, and then there's another one in the middle of the state. I don't remember what it is, but, um, you know, we have more more companies, more markets coming online that were medical, that are going to recreational, that are just giving easier access. I'm really curious to see, and I don't know if you have an opinion on this, how this country moves forward towards the step of federal legalization. And this is, you know, obviously we're getting both out of our areas of expertise and more into the area of speculation, but you know, how this, this country will legalize cannabis and what it will do for us. Right. It, to me, and we'll get political here for a second, not super political, but we're, we're in a recession, right? The, the definition of recession is happening, whether people want to recognize it or not. And your political beliefs can tell you that, but we're in a recession. And I've been saying not that I'm a genius or, or any kind of Nostradamus, that this industry has the ability to prevent that and, and put us into another uh, renaissance, if you will, for this country. We 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 have jobs. We, the last revolution or the last evolution of the industry here has been tech. And as much as tech was, and I, I made a great living off of it, it required a certain level of specified education um, to be able to access that industry. And, you know, it, it was a more educated person, a more specialized thing to do, but you have an industry like cannabis that is going back to blue collar, where there are truck drivers, where there are factory workers, where there are retail employees, where there are farm workers and all this stuff. And there's so much opportunity for it. I think this country is missing the opportunity to legalize it even just from a, a hemp standpoint and an industrial hemp standpoint so i think yeah. short term the thc side of the business can really kind of start pumping money into the economy from a tax standpoint from an employment standpoint even the jobs to create these dispensaries and cultivations the massive amount of construction but long term i think it would be absolutely amazing if our country became a leader in industrial hemp in, in hemp building materials I think that would put us right back from the top, no question. So I'd love to hear your views in the industry and the different parts of it. And where do you think it's going to take us? Yeah. So, I mean, a couple of things uh, to comment there. I agree with you that, you know, the, the movement needs to be there. And I, we've seen a tremendous surge uh, in the industry in all aspects. 
a um, couple of things from Pew Research. So 91% of Americans favor some type of marijuana legalization and 60% say it should be legal for medical and recreational use. So a lot of the impact is going to be from the people themselves, regardless of what state they're in, not just in California, uh, not just in New England. Uh, you know, 91% of Americans favor some type of legalization says a lot to me in terms of the power of, of what the people want. Um, 70 another uh, piece from New Frontier data, 77% of consumers think there should be public spaces where cannabis use is allowed, like cafes and so forth. So I think the demand is going to be there. I think balancing that is uh, organizations like the U.S. Cannabis Council. I, I'm a fan of the U.S. Cannabis Council. There are lobbying uh, activity down in uh, in Washington, D.C., very active in this space. Stephen Hawkins is their CEO, and he does great work. I sit on the Cannabis Council. I'm actually on the Responsibility Committee. So they have folks sitting on the council that um, that they believe have some influence in terms of what uh, what can be said in terms of legalization and, and, and what could be said at the state and federal level. So I think the power of the people and the power of the lobbyists and the power of the forces that are driving uh, this forward, I think that's going to take hold. Um, states will always, there'll always be potentially states like Texas and Idaho that will resist, you know, and that may take a lot longer. But the vast majority, I think, you know, will follow the way of Illinois and Colorado and California and throughout New England. You know, here in my home state of New Jersey, uh, you know, they can't, they're lined up. They can't get those licenses fast enough. And people are just chomping at the bit. There's billboards all over the place. The advertising and marketing is tremendous around this. It's an exciting time. It's like that. Yeah, this is, New Jersey is coming into it. And that's happening in New York. So I think that that motivation and that momentum will continue. I will tell you personally, I am so excited about New Jersey because I am from New Jersey. I'm from East Brunswick, New Jersey, and I cannot wait to bring our brand Heisman to New Jersey. That, that to me, my counterpart Lane is actually landing in Philadelphia today. So we launched with Tilt Holdings in September in Pennsylvania, and he's from Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. So he gets to bring the brand home. I think New Jersey will be in the near future for us. So I'm really excited. And then uh, one of our third co-founders, uh, Eric Hammond, our CEO, he's from Florida. So obviously a Ricky Williams brand needs to be down here. But that's, I'm so, the, new, the fact that there is legal cannabis in New Jersey blows my mind. The fact that New York has legalized it to the point where you can essentially smoke cannabis wherever you can smoke cigarettes, like blew my mind. I remember just walking down the streets of Manhattan smoking a joint. It's perfectly fine. You, need, you can't even buy it anywhere technically illegal. So we're we're in an amazing world, I think. Um, as far as the public spaces go, I'm going to be very interested to see how that goes. Because, uh, you know, I bring it up. With New York, you can smoke anywhere. You can smoke a cigarette. That's kind of how I... That's, I'm very free and open about smoking cannabis. I'm, I, don't, I don't mind talking about it. I don't mind doing it. I'm not embarrassed when I do it. But I do still treat it like a cigarette. It's where it has smoke coming off of it and people get bothered by that. So like, I'm not going to be the, the jerk who's standing in front of the restaurant patio smoking, bothering everybody. I'll be around the corner doing it, but you are going to smell. If you smell it, sorry, it's what's going to happen, but I'm not going to bother you with it. So I'm very interested to see how the public spaces come because I think you need to have a mix of, of smokers and non-smokers there for it to truly be enjoyable. Um, I think what everybody looks at, and I know I'm going off on a tangent here in this show, it happens a lot on the show, I think everybody says they want consumption lounges. Um, I don't think they do. And, and if you've been to one of these more recent consumption lounges, especially the ones attached to dispensaries, they suck. They're, they're just dark rooms with a bunch of dirty glass that you can smoke weed in where it's like, I'd rather go to my buddy's house where I can be myself and not have to worry about it. I think the, the OG cannabis cafe that figured out how to have a restaurant with a liquor license and then a, a consumption lounge on the same property genius what planet 13 is doing where they're technically a mall so they can have a comfortable consumption lounge inside like i think there are people now figuring out the right way to do it so i'm very interested to see how that public consumption comes to and hey more opportunity for you guys because there's going to be a whole bunch of liability insurance on that one 
Absolutely. We insure a lot of restaurants and, and, uh, and hospitality is a big part of our book of business. And it's interesting that restaurateurs are looking for new and innovative ways to attract uh, attract folks to their restaurants, not just with great food, but with other things. You know, we're seeing axe throwing and knife throwing in the back room and, you know, anything that'll be uh, beneficial to draw an audience. And this fits right into that whole mold in terms of a differentiator. So, yeah, I think I think you'll see that very prevalent uh, and coming soon. That's funny that you mentioned axe throwing. I, I, whoever came up with the idea that axe throwing, I mean, listen, don't get me wrong. I love it. I'm a, I'm a man's man just like that. But axe throwing with a whole bunch of drunk people, like, I can't believe there's not a whole section on YouTube of just accidents with that. My buddy, <laughs> my, we were in a group chat with my buddy the other night, and he was just saying these belligerent things. So we knew he had been drinking. It was a late Saturday night. And the next day, he's like, sorry, guys. I was out, blah, 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 at the, the axe place. I'm like, Jesus. I'm like, we able to see the bullseye. So, um, Frank, we've been talking for the most part of an hour. Anything that you want to let the cannabis industry know, the companies know that we may not have covered before we let you go? The only thing I'll mention is that I, I first, I appreciate this time. Uh, and I hope that your listeners, you know, really do the right thing in terms of their planning and everything, not just about insurance, but they're planning for their businesses. And I wish them much, much success. Now, our our business uh, is very traditional. World Insurance is a traditional uh, independent insurance brokerage, but we have a far reach. You know, we're licensed in all fifty states, and we have a dedicated cannabis practice with twelve of my colleagues, and that's all they do is counsel for these types of clients. So, uh, I say that to you to say we're committed. You know, we're good insurance people. Uh, we're committed to the industry, and if you need a friend in insurance. Uh, you know, world insurance is probably a firm you should consider. Um, and we're we're here to help anytime. Very cool. I'm very glad that there are folks like you coming in and, and coming in before everybody else and supporting this industry, because the more we can normalize it, the more we can keep everybody safe, the better this industry is going to be. And then, Frank, let them know websites, phone numbers, emails, let them, let them know where they can find you. Sure. Best best way to contact us is go to our website, which is worldinsurance.com. And all of our contact information is right there. You can look me up, Frank Costa, and you'll see my direct email address and my cell phone number. There is also a page specific to cannabis uh, on our website. So go to worldinsurance.com, type in cannabis in the search, and we have a lot of information on there, much of which I shared with you today. Uh, and uh, that's the easiest way to connect with us and Happy to help anytime. Frank, you're a wealth of knowledge. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Todd. It's been my pleasure. Absolutely. And thank you to everybody at home. This is another episode of Elevate Your Grind. Join us on August 25th in Delray Beach, Florida for our panel on diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's going to be at Opportunities the week prior on the 18th, August 18th. That is going to be our online virtual government relations panel. If you want more information on that, check it out at jointlab.com, folks. Thank you for joining to me. Thank you for joining today. Um, I will do my best to stay out of jail with the police knocking on my door. We'll see you guys next week.